There have been times in my life, I've gone, everyone has. We've all gone through hard times. Anyone here ever gone through hard times? You've ever, have you ever felt like you're being pressed in the wine press? Have you, ever, have you ever been under stress? Have you ever been under strain? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Been there. Done that. Bought the t-shirt and I can proudly bear the scars. There's times that I've been down. I'm not talking about years ago. I'm talking about maybe a couple of weeks ago. Maybe, maybe last week. Sometimes I get down. Sometimes I get depressed. There's some people that deal with that. I've sat with people, talked with people, people in my own family. Uh, I, 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 we have people in my family that suffer depression at times. And uh, you try to talk them through it. My daughter, my one daughter, she's testified about it, that she's had panic attacks. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's trying on the person but it's trying on the father that's trying to help them get through that, too. You know that. And you just keep speaking the scripture, and you keep talking, and you keep reasoning. And uh, sometimes, did you ever feel like they were coming to get you, but you just didn't know who they were or why they were coming to get you? Been there. Done that. Bought the t-shirt. I know what that's like. I've been with people who have had varying degrees of this, this battle. I've said in the mental health ward, visiting people, that I'll tell you, when I left, I didn't think they'd ever be a functional person again. Only to have them in later down the road, maybe weeks or months, I don't remember, walk in the door of the church, and I was just amazed at what God was doing in their hearts and their lives. Amen. And then there are others that just, just you know, it's just a mild thing. But I want to talk to you today about peace. Peace. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 27, He said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. And this is, I love this phrase, Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. He is a, the, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Peace I give you. Not as the world gives. The world gives and takes away. The world is it's, it's a facade. It's, it's, it's thing. It's plastic. It's not, it's not permanent. But this is an eternal spiritual peace that I give to you. Now go to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7. And we're going to be coming back to Philippians later on. Chapter 4 verse 7. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God which passes all understanding. And what he's saying is, let the peace of God, let the peace of God empire and rule in your hearts and where else? And in your minds. So what do I mean by, by peace? Peace, I look in, in Webster's, the English uh, definition of peace, I wrote down a few things. The freedom from disturbance. Sometimes you're disturbed in your spirit and God has put it there because you need to be disturbed. My dog never barks at anybody. Never. You go to the door tonight, he'll come up and he'll want you to pet him. And he's 135 pounds. State cop came to the door one night. And they were looking for Kitty. No, I'm only kidding. They were looking for Kitty. There was a dog, a stray dog in the neighborhood, and they thought it was ours. I guess we have so many dogs, they just think every dog around belongs to us. About 3 o'clock in the morning, Jordan went to the front. We have a closed in front porch. Jordan went to the door to talk to the cop, and the dog went nuts. Went nuts over the state cop. But everybody else, no. My wife said there was a stray dog came into the yard one day, and the hair in the back of his neck and his back stood straight up. He had a disturbance. Sometimes God puts that disturbances, but other times we're just 
We have a disturbance and we're uneasiness and we're not settled and we don't know why. And I don't know if it's if it's if it's a chemical imbalance at times, or at times I believe it's spiritual, it's a spiritual warfare. But peace is the freedom from disturbance. It's quiet and tranquility. The older we get, the more we like to have our quiet times, right? It's a quiet calm. It's freedom from or the cessation of war or violence. And it's also agreement or harmony. Now we got a peace treaty. I'm at peace. I've had a disagreement with a family member. Now there's peace. There's harmony. We're on the same page. One country may be at peace with another. The biblical concept of peace comes from the Hebrew word, the Hebrew root, uh, salam, or salam. We would say shalom. This, this peace in the scripture, throughout the epistles, we see that greeting, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, and they're constantly saying, may the peace of God keep you. Remember, the first century church was a church in great uh, upheaval and persecution in some places. They were pressed. In Jerusalem, they all fled except for the, uh, the disciples. And that probably was a good thing because when they fled from that persecution, what happened? They spread the gospel all over the world. But the Hebrew <coughs> root means this, to be complete, to be whole, to be sound, to be well. It, it, when it's used as a greeting, it means this, Health, prosperity, thank you, and victory. So, when you hear someone say, peace, maybe they're saying, be healthy, be prosperous, be victorious. And there's sometimes, there are people that don't have that. Now, why is it that in this life, in this world, Jesus said, in this life you shall have tribulation. But fear not, for I have overcome the world. So what, what brought this, this, this disturbance and this unpeacefulness into the world? Well, the fall of man. With the fall of man, what's really at the root cause of there not being peace is there's two things about peace. There's peace with God and peace of God. And you can never have peace, the peace of God of God, the peace that God gives to a heart and soul, until you're at peace with God. And the sinner is not at peace with God. The fall brought about enmity. Turn to James chapter 4 and verse 4. James 4, 4. Ye, adult, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Friendship with the world. I like uh, what the prophet said of Mount Carmel. How long halt ye between two opinions? If God be God, serve him. If Baal be God, then serve him. We can't straddle the fence. The friendship of the world is at enmity with God. Whoso there Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. God said it. The Apostle James said it under the inspiration and anointing of the Holy Spirit. The friend, whosoever is a friend of the world is the enemy of God. One time I preached at a church, and I think I got myself in trouble. Oh, that, that happens sometimes. And... Uh, I think I upset some woman, which little did she know I had been married for probably 25 years at that point, and I'm used to having upset a woman in my life, you know. <laughs> I, 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 I say about people, I, the lady, sometimes ladies on the phone at work will get really upset and work on about stuff. And I'll tell my coworker, she's under the impression that a woman being mad at me intimidates me. In 35 years of marriage, it no longer intimidates me. I just say yes, dear, and walk the other way. But, uh, I said this at a church one time, and listen, I'm, I, I, we've got to get this political correctness stuff out of our mind. We need to start to think and act biblically. Amen? 
Think and act biblically. If you, and I'm not saying that we should hate them, that we should hunt them down, that we should run them over. I'm not saying that about the sinner. We love them. However, they, there are people that are enemies of the cross. And I made a statement about Islam. I said, Islam is the enemy of the cross. It's true. They're in a, they, if they are part of this world philosophy, world thinking, if they're outside of Christ, they're an enemy of God. They're an enemy of God. Isaiah said, There is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. He said that in Isaiah 48, 22. He said it again in Isaiah 57, 21. There is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. Now, I've been with, I don't know how many people, not hundreds. I mean, not nowhere near that. But I've been with some people when they've left this when they've left this world. And I, I've held their hands, or I've sat by, by them, or I've stood by them. I've closed the eyes on more than one person after they died. And I see. I'm not going to say that every sinner is in torment when they leave this life. I won't say that. But I will tell you that when I'm in the room of a saint of God and they have passed this life, there is a lingering peace. Because Jesus has come into the room and taken them to be with him. There's a difference. I, I say to my wife, I, uh, I always, you know, now that we don't get a paper every day in the Harrisburg area, but I do try to pick one up, the Pottsville paper on a Saturday and I don't even know most of the people up there. Once in a while, they'll have someone from in here. But I read the obituaries. What's the first thing you do when you read the obituaries? Look to see how old they are. I'm sorry. I just did. I want to see if it's getting close to home. But then I read the, the little remarks in there. And lots of times they'll say, uh, Fred passed away peacefully. Mary passed away peacefully. In all the years I've read obituaries, I've never read... He, he went out kicking and screaming. <laughs> if that were the case, I wonder if they put... He left here, he was ripping hold of life, trying to hang on to it. But I've been with people that have that, that, been great peace after they've left this, left this life. Because what happened with those folks is there was no more hostilities toward God. There was no more enmity with God. That had been taken care of long ago. I like that hymn. The old account was settled long ago. Yeah. Long ago, long ago. Oh, the old account was settled long ago. Amen. You know, make your peace. I heard, I've had people tell me this. My mother had congestive heart failure, failure a year before she finally died with congestive heart failure. And she said to me, uh, she said, I made my peace with God. She already been saved. She said, I had peace. I said, were you afraid? She said, no. She's the only thing, my kids were right there. And uh, when she started, it was in the like, 10 o'clock in the morning, she said, I just said, dear Jesus, don't let me die in front of these kids. She didn't want to die in front of the kids. And she did. A year later, it was in the middle of the night that she had this problem. And, uh, we got her to the hospital, but she succumbed. She did not come back. I think I told you before that that morning when we were at Pot Point Hospital, these hymns kept going through my heart and mind. I don't want to hear these hymns, but they were going in there. God was giving me peace. Peace. So the fall of man brought enmity, but the cross brought peace and reconciliation. I think some Christians struggle at times because they don't know what Christ has done for them. They don't have a full appreciation of the blood of Jesus. Whom the Son shall set free is what? Free. Now, I'm not saying you're not going to get down at times. I'm not saying you're not going to struggle. We have to, keep, we have to keep revisiting these things and keep coaching our hearts and keep telling, talking to ourselves, reminding ourselves of these truths. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him, by Jesus, to reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled 
in the body of his flesh through death, and I love this next part, to present you holy and unblameable and unremovable in his sight. Mm -hmm. So what is that saying? So this is what it's saying. That the divide between God and man has been resolved through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that one day when you stand before him, my mother used to always say, I'll have to stand before my maker one day. And that, that is an awesome thought to stop and think. I can't even, you know, I have a hard time wrapping my mind around that. I can't imagine what heaven would be like. I know, and I know intellectually <coughs> that one day I will die. I uh, hope it's 30 years from now. But it might be 30 days from now. It could be 30 minutes from now. I just don't know. But one day I will die. And I have to stand before God. Paul said that the judgment seat of Christ, he referred to it as the terror of the Lord. But yet we have great comfort and peace in knowing this, that he will present us holy, unblameable, and unremovable in his sight. I mean, so many Christians would say, that tell me that they just don't feel like they're free. Can I tell you a secret? I got those feelings too. And I have to battle them off because they're not from God. God knows the thoughts that He has of me. God loves you. God cares about you. And He's going to present you before His Father, not in your righteousness, not in your merits, but in the merits of Jesus and the merits of the cross. Do you ever notice something about the early church? Yes, they were a Holy Ghost filled church, but they were also preachers of the cross and preachers of the resurrection. That's why they saw such great transformation in the lives of people. In Romans chapter 5, I'm going to go there. If you have your Bibles, you want to turn with me, you can. Romans 5 and verse uh, 8. 5 verse 8. Let me make sure I'm in the right chapter. Here it is. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by what? By his blood. I'm covered in the blood. You know what justification means? Just as if I had never sinned. He will take your sins and he will remove them as far as the east is from the west, the 103rd Psalm says. But I keep remembering me. But I have to look to the cross. Every time you feel inferior as a human being, every time you feel inferior as a Christian, look to Jesus. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. Look away from yourself. I'm not saying that you deny and, and say, you know, confession is good for the soul. I, I, I said to the Lord one time years ago when I was working at Willow Shoe Factory, I was discouraged with myself one morning. I must have got mad at someone. I don't remember what it was. I must have, must have fallen off the handle. I did that back then. I do that now too, but that's another story. But uh, <clears throat> I can't tell the Lord. Seems like I'm always repenting. Seems like I'm always always telling you that I need help with something and I'm sorry. And right there in that factory in that cutting room, you know what the Holy Spirit dropped in my heart? It is godly people that repent. The ungodly do not repent. So if you find yourself repenting, it's a good thing. But we're justified not by our works, but by His blood which shall be saved from wrath through him. We're going to be saved from the wrath through him by his justification. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And this is what this verse is saying. He paid the price. He paid the debt. He has justified you. And now his life is inside of you. He lives within you. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So our prayer is this, Thou mighty Christ, come forth in me. Live in me. Live through me. Help me to live and walk worthy of the calling that you've called me to. I like the verse over in the other chapter. He said in verse 25 of chapter 4, 
He was delivered for our offenses. He died for our sins. And what happened? <coughs> he was raised for our justification. <coughs> Do you believe in the resurrection? If Jesus be not risen, what does the scripture say? Then we are of all men most what? Miserable. So people who don't believe in the resurrection aren't going to have this peace and this, this, settled, this settled spirit in their hearts. But we are people of the resurrection. We believe that he died. He was buried. He rose again. We believe he ascended and was exalted uh, to the right hand of God on high. And there he ever lives to make intercession for who? For us. Thank God. Does God care about your, your inner tranquility? Does God care about your, uh, I guess the world would call it, your psychological? I tell them at work, I'm due for a psychological day off. I got some coming. Does God care about what's happening inside your heart, inside your, your mind, inside your spirit? Yes, he does. So much so that Jesus ever lives to make intercession for you. Thank God. Thank God. Ephesians chapter, not Ephesians, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, let's go there. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. We won't be much longer. He said as he entered into his third hour of preaching. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. That at, time, that at the time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now in Christ, ye who were sometimes were afar off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So what does that mean? We were far away from God, but we've been brought close by the blood of Jesus. Remember, his blood speaks better things than that of Abel's, Hebrews tells us. The blood of Abel's cried out from the earth for vengeance because of what his brother did to him. Jesus' blood cries out for mercy because of what he did for us. For he is our peace, who has made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make himself of twain one new man, so making peace, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the, en the enmity thereby. You see, you have been joined to God through Christ. I like the, the stanza from the hymn, Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan, Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. I saw a picture one time, a drawing of a <coughs> great plain. And in the middle of this plain was this great ravine, this great chasm, this great divide. On one side it said man. On the other side, it said God. And there was a span, a bridge that was going across, and it said Calvary. You see, we've been joined together with God. The hostilities have ceased. You, let me ask you this. I, I said this to my daughter the other, the other week. I said, I feel like God's mad about me about something. Like God's ticked off. She said, Why did you feel that way, Dad? You believe in Jesus? You believe Jesus has saved you? I'm not discounting that we can't come under conviction. That's a different thing. But what I'm talking about is God's not mad at me. I can grieve the Holy Spirit if I'm not obedient. But he's constantly reaching back and saying, come on now, come on, come here, come here, come here. We are his children. We've been bought with a price. We're covered in his blood. 
we've been joined together. There is a peace covenant because he's broken down the middle wall of partition so that God doesn't have to be far away from you anymore. Why, he's nigh unto you and even more so, he is within you. <coughs> you have just as much access to God as anyone else that's a Christian. There are no great men of God. There are only men of a great God. So, now that we understand, and we'll go quickly here as we conclude, now that we understand that the issue of, of God being angry with us has been taken care of at the cross of Calvary. Remember, the scripture says that Jesus was the propitiation of our sins. Boy, there's a $10 uh, lawyer word. That propitiation means that he was the object of God's wrath on sin. Yet we did, Isaiah said, yet we did esteem him smitten and stricken of God. But when we see Jesus bloodied and battered and beaten and buried the sins of the world, we see him, yes, the Roman soldiers did it. Yes, the Jewish hierarchy did it. Yes, the crowd that cried out for the release of Barabbas was, was responsible. Yes, our sins are being borne on him. We bear some responsibility for his death. But yet we have to also remember that he was smitten and stricken of God. For our sins. For our peace. Peace is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We read that in Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is. What's one of the nine words? Peace. Peace. Galatians 1.3. I, I, this, this, I, I'm reading through the uh, New Testament. Uh, right now. And uh, I have no. No methodical way that I read the scripture, whatever I feel like the Lord, the Lord leads me to a book I'm reading, if doesn't lead me one, I just pick one. Uh, but I've been reading the epistles, I hadn't read them for probably since about last year at this time, I don't know. Anyhow, I keep reading and I'll give you an example, Galatians 1.3, grace and peace to you from, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we say that the peace is a fruit of the Spirit, it's a byproduct of the Holy Spirit's activity in the life and heart of a believer. Hang on to that promise. If you're struggling with depression, if you're struggling with not being at peace, if you don't like yourself, eh? anybody ever not like themselves? I don't always like myself. You know, other times I think I'm a pretty terrific guy. So that's another sin called audience and pride, I guess. But if you're, if you're struggling with that, I want you to hang on to this. The fruit of the Spirit is peace. And you can lay claim to that. But it comes from God. It comes from the Father. It comes from the Holy Spirit. It comes from Jesus. Then why do we struggle? Well, we have to maintain that. The path that sustains peace is found in the scriptures too. Let's go back to Philippians. I said we would go back to that. Philippians chapter 4. Prayer. Prayer. I tell people. I told my family. When they're struggling with anxiety. And they're struggling with depression. And it is a real thing. There are people that really do have a, a real struggle. But I tell them pray. And I'll pray with them. And I'll sit with you. And I'll listen to you. you got to have a lot of patience sometimes. But you know what? Somebody had patience with me at one time. <clears throat> when, when our daughter Alice, I, I know she doesn't mind me sharing this. And if she does, that's okay. I'm her father. She'll get over it. Right? When she was struggling with that, there were times I just said to myself, Oh my gosh. Please, somebody slap her into reality here for crying out loud. You have to be patient. And we had to go over the same things over and over and over again. And there were times that I would get the call. I'm on my way to work. And I work that middle second shift, 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning. I'm getting this call. And I know she's at home with her kids in Carlisle. Her husband's working. And she has such awesome fear coming over her. And I just kept speaking the scripture. And I said, Alice, pray. Pray. Here's been my experience. 
when I feel heavy in my spirit, when I feel, feel anxious, when the devil's lying to me, when he's telling me all kinds of stuff, I pray and I cry out to God. I just pray in the spirit. I pray in, in a <coughs> groan. Sometimes it's not even words you can utter. It's groanings which cannot even be uttered. But you pray. Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing. 